بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وآله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزلنا علما ربي يسر لي أمري وشرح لي صدري وحل العقدة من لساني يبقاه قولي إن شاء الله this is a, a quick overview of what's known as القواعد الفقهية which is beneficial in terms of studying uh, fiqh or the law in order to understand what the intentions behind the law are. So the first thing that should be understood is although unlike the Mu'tazila who were the rationalists, we do not believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has to uh, benefit His creation. The Mu'tazila said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that what he did had to be for the benefit of his creation. It was a wajib for Allah. Whereas we don't say that. Allah does it out of his bounty, not out of any obligation. So the first thing to know is that the Sharia ah and, and the, the Usuriyun or the people of these roots say that all of the sacred dispensations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the human are based on the preservation of five matters, all. So every sharia ah that was given to the human being was in order to protect five things. The first of which is deen itself. Because the human being is a homo religiosus, he's, he is a religious creature by nature. The human being is a religious creature by nature. Human beings will act out ritual in every culture. This is something anthropologists recognize. Anybody who studies human societies recognize that every society has rituals. Yet are those rituals from the human being himself or are they derived from revelation? This is the difference between the Muslim and the rest of societies. And I'm, not, and I'm saying Muslim here in the ideal sense because many Muslims around the world have fallen into ritual that is not from Allah and Allah gave them no authority to do that. Many, many examples we could use from the Muslim world for those things. Now some of them would go under what's known as urf or customary practice. But others are clearly against the teaching of Islam. For instance, the female giving a dowry in a wedding. You will find that in some Muslim countries where the female is forced to give a dowry because of previous religious traditions that were strong in those cultures and yet that is against Islam. So that's an example of tradition becoming part of a yahaliya or an ignorance within the culture. So Islam is not against the customs of a people. Islam honors people. Where it goes Islam acts as a sieve. It doesn't say everybody has to become Arab. Right? Like for instance, when I happen to be wearing a uh, Moroccan dress, I'm not a Moroccan. I don't have to wear this dress. There's nothing in my deen that tells me I have to wear this dress. Right? Nothing. There's nothing in my deen that says I have to wear a turban. Now, this is not even Sunnah dress, really. This robe, the type they wear in North Africa, is not from the Sunnah. The turban is Sunnah of Adat. And some say Sunnah of. Uh, Fadail, that it's a virtuous thing because it's virtuous to bury a person with a turban. So many of the scholars have said it is a sunnah of fadail because there are weak hadiths that indicate that it's a good thing to wear a turban. But there's nothing in sharia that in order to be a Muslim you have to wear a turban. And if you don't wear a turban you're not a good Muslim. Nothing says that. It's encouraged to cover the head. It's mandub cover the head. It's a good thing for men to cover their head. So there are adat or characteristics and qualities within cultures. When Islam comes to a culture, it shakes things up like a sieve, min khad. And it will separate what is good from the culture and what is bad. And this is why if you travel across the Muslim world, Muslims aren't all eating Arab food. Right? The Arabs have peculiar foods, and even within Arab cultures there are differences. 
So if you go to the Arabian Peninsula, they don't eat like the Syrians. They don't eat like the Yemenis. They don't eat like the North Africans. If you go to Indonesia, they eat different food. If you go to China, Chinese Muslims eat Chinese food. So these are just qualities and characteristics of culture that Islam leaves within the realm of mubah, within the realm of norm, within the realm of custom. But when the culture has a custom that goes against the teachings of Islam, then it is incumbent upon the people within that culture when they embrace Islam to relinquish those things and to abandon them. That's what the, the Muslim is, is commanded to do, to leave jahiliyyah, to leave the ignorance of the previous uh, life. So when we do that, what we're doing is we're submitting to a teaching and what we are saying, and this is the power of religion over the mind of the human creature. Because when a human being embraces a religion, what they are doing is they are recognizing there is truth outside of my experience. I recognize that truth and I'm submitting to that truth. And so a person who fully surrenders to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing at that point to abandon his previous or her previous world view for the truth. And that's an amazing thing and people have done it. Historically people have done that. The human being can do that. If you look at when Islam moved to, uh, to Africa, see Islam civilized Africa in the same way that Christianity civilized Europe to a certain degree. Every culture is based on a book. It is the book that civilizes people. It is the book that brings uh, consciousness to people. It is the book that humanizes people. And every culture has a book. And the book of Islam is the Qur'an. The book of the Muslim peoples is the Qur'an. So when the Muslims went to Africa, they went into cultures that had many, many jahiliya practices. And they abandoned those practices for the truth of Islam. But then the practices re-emerge. And this is an interesting phenomenon because we have to ask where is this re-emergence from? Where is it coming from? To give you an example, I don't know how many people know about Burning Man. Anybody here know about Burning Man? Burning Man is a phenomenon in California that started I think about 10 or 15 years ago where a man who had lovelorn troubles he'd uh, lost his girlfriend or something and somebody told him we should do something to get your mind off this so they decided to build a 40 foot man of wood and burn him <laughs> like whatever gets you through the night right <laughs> <laughs> so they did this and they took this huge uh, wood man to a beach in San Francisco and they reassembled it and there was this huge man and then they put gas and lit it on fire and suddenly everybody on the beach came and it happened to be the time of the solstice and all these people came onto the beach and surround and they recognized something amazing is happening here in fact one woman actually touched uh, put her hand into the fire and got severely burnt touching this uh, burning man and this became a ritual that was repeated now every year. The last one that was, I think, is somewhere near Barstow or something. There were over 20,000 people there. <laughs> and it's like a Dionysian. It's become like this cult, Dionysian cult. In New Mexico, this is Zobra. Zobra, the, all these times. <laughs> it's a Dionysian cult. They go and they dance naked. And they, it's a very, very strange thing. But the burning man is wicker man. You see, the, ancient, the, the pagans in Europe used to do the same thing build this huge man from, from wicker and fill it with uh, offerings to their pagan gods and burn them. It was a ritual they did around the solstice. So what, where does that emerge from? For the Muslims we would say this is shaitan bringing back his gifts to the culture. Really, it's, there's something within uh, the human condition where these things re-emerge again and again. And the thing about shaitan, which is interesting, is he is not original. 
Shaitan doesn't come every, he's always coming with the same thing. They slightly change and there will be variations of them and things. But they're basically similar things. He brings a type of jahiliyyah uh, to people's, and for some reason, although there are similarities around the world, there are going to be different ones for different cultures and different peoples because peoples are not the same and they're different. So this same thing, phenomenon, occurs within the Muslim cultures. A jahiliyyah reemerges that had been absent. It's almost like it went to sleep and then somebody wakes it up. And the Prophet cursed the one who wakes up a sleeping fitna. In other words, fitna can go to sleep but it doesn't mean it's not there. And it can be aroused. So, the sharia is the protection for us. This is what protects us. Allah says, if you disagree about a thing, فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Take it back to Allah and His Messenger. ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ Right? That's better for you. Right? وَأَحْسَنُ تَأْوِيلًا And that's the most perfect of interpretations, of understanding. So take things back to Allah and His Messenger. What does Allah and His Messenger say here? Now when we submit to Allah and His Messenger, what we are submitting to is we are submitting to the fact that Allah and His Messenger know what is good for us. Allah knows what is good for us and He taught His Messenger what is good for us and His Messenger communicated to us what is good for us. The Prophet ﷺ said, I did not find any evil except that I warned you about it. Nor did I know of any good except that I showed you the path to it. That's a blessing from our Prophet. Everything that he prohibited us to do, he did it because he knew there was harm in it for us. Everything that he told us to do, he did it because he knew there was good in it for us. And Allah is the one who taught him that through Jibreel alayhi salam. So to understand sharia is to understand that this is for the benefit of the human being. And the first and primary benefit is the preservation of the true deen with Allah which is tawheed. The deen is tawheed. The sharia will differ. But the deen is tawheed and this must be preserved within the human community. What tawheed does is it frees people from the chains, from the yoke of creation. And, and the, the free man in Islam is not like people in this culture think. People in this culture associate liberty, right? There's a Latin word, liber, free. Liberty with freedom. They associate this idea that I'm free to do what I want. Now the problem with that argument is, is that if the person is doing what their nafs wants, they're not free, they're a slave. That true freedom is doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, that is freedom by definition in, in, in Islam. The Abdullah is the only real hur, that's the only free human being is the one who's a servant to Allah and no longer a slave to himself and the one who is a slave to himself is not free and will never be free until he's freed of himself. And this is why in the Arabic language the word for freed slave is also the word for master, mawla. Mawla is, is from the adadad, it's from the words that have an opposite meaning. Mawla is a master like we call Allah, mawlana. Mawla is master and mawla is freed slave. So the freed slave is the one who is a master of himself. That is the freed slave. And the one who is a slave to himself is a slave and has no freedom. So no matter how much freedom they give people in this culture or any other culture, if they're out fornicating, if they're out uh, chasing their personal passions, if their passions take them to destruction, if their addictions take them to destruction, they're not free, they're slaves. They're just slaves to the wrong thing. They're Abdul Makhluq and they're not Abdul Khaliq. They're a slave of creation and they're not a slave of the Creator. And this is why uh, Amr ibn Rabi, his great statement, he's a Bedouin man, comes into the court of Kisra, the great Persian, Kosros. And he asked them, he asked him, what's, what's this thing you, you're calling uh, us to? And he said, we are calling you to becoming those who worship the creator of things and not those who are slaves of created things. We are coming to free you from the slavery of things to the slavery of the creator of things. And that's real freedom. And that's what Islam came to offer to the human condition. If you accept that, 
and understand that then deen is the first thing and the tawheed is the most important thing because once you understand that Allah is the only one who can harm you Allah is the only one that can benefit you then you're freed of superstitions look at the superstitions in cultures they're everywhere rife cultures are rife with superstition this country is filled with superstition why don't they have a 13th floor in their buildings seriously why don't they have a 13th floor you go to a hospital they don't have a 13th floor I'm not making that up why a, ra a society built on rationalism why does it go from 12 to 14 seriously it's an interesting question why are people afraid to go out on Friday the 13th why are people afraid when a black cat crosses them why are they afraid of broken mirrors why are they afraid of opening umbrellas in a house this is really there's people all over this country that, that, that uh, knock wood right you've seen people do that right now why are they doing it you can say well it's just you know it's, oh, it's just a wise, wives tale they called them right no why are they why are you still doing it <laughs> right so people are filled with superstition Islam came to free us from all that and there are those who say well the Muslims are superstitious don't you do all these prayers to protect yourself don't you do all the really they'll say that they'll say you have superstition ours is different I knock wood you say a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim what a difference between the two really you know one is from uh, reality and the other is wahm it's just an illusion so the first is the preservation of deen and, this, and that is primary because we'll even give our life to preserve the deen Really, the life has to be even given to, to maintain the preservation of deen. The next is the preservation of life. Sharia came to preserve life. And this is why if you kill a person, you are killed. Lakum fil qisasi haya. You have in retribution life. So if somebody kills a life unjustly, they forfeit their life. And in that is life for the society. It is a deterrent. Right? Detar in Latin means to wash out uh, dirt, filth, you see. It's a deterrent. You have to get, get, get rid of it before it spread. Like gang, gangrene. You have to cut off part of the body in order to save the whole body. So, life is one of the things Sharia came to preserve. And it gave us rules to preserve life. And then it came to preserve Nasab, which is lineage. People, it is a right of a human being to know who their people are. You should know who you're from. Like what happened in this country with the uh, African black people in this country in the, in the 1950s. Really, it goes back to earlier than that. But the idea of attaching an X to the name. That was a statement. You know, this is what the, the nationalist movement was making what they were saying is X is the mathematical symbol for the unknown and what we're doing is rejecting our slave name like Washington see a black man whose name is Washington he didn't come over on the Mayflower right he didn't come over on the Mayflower he, he why does he have a nice Anglo-Saxon name because that was a name that was just given to him right some of these, the blacks when they were freed, they literally just gave them the names. Washington, Jefferson, Carver, Smith, like that, just names. And some of them took the names of their uh, masters, like that. So what they were doing is they were saying, no, we don't accept that anymore. We don't know who we are, but we know we're not Washington. Right? That's, at least we know that now. They didn't know that for a long time, so that's a type of consciousness. But... What they were saying is, we don't know, and this is a, a right that was taken away from us. That was taken away from us. They were literally stripped from their families. And that was erased from their consciousness. Because children were taken from their parents and sold into slavery. And this is what happened. This, is, this happened in this country. So a human being has the right to know his lineage, who he is, 
who, who, who your father is. And this is why in fornication the rules are so strong. Because with fornication that breaks down. And this is why a woman who bears a child out of childbirth, even if the father is quote-unquote known, that child does not out of wedlock. <laughs> even if the child is born out of wedlock and knows the father, right? And knows the father. The child does not take that father's name. Doesn't take the name. A, a bastard cannot say, that's my father. By sharia. Cannot say that. Even if you did a genetic test, anything. No. A, a Ibn Zina has no lineage. By sharia. None. Why? Because every religion, every deen has recognized marriage. Every deen. Marriage is the way lineage is preserved. The Muslims are polygynous and not, uh, they are not polyandrous. Because a woman will not know if she takes more than one husband, who is the father of the child. And you can't say, oh, well, we could do a DNA test. 80% of the world doesn't have telephones. You know, DNA tests aren't cheap. They cost a lot of money, right? 80% of the world doesn't have telephones. So don't, you know, don't use this, you know, the, the people of Bayan, they say, The anomaly is something you keep in mind, but you don't use it as a standard to measure things. So, and Islam permits polygyny because the lineage can be preserved. If there's one progenitor, a woman will know if she guards her uh, private parts, she will know who is the father of her husband, uh, who is the father of her child. And the child has a right. Now, if a man has an Emma, which is a bondswoman, and the bondswoman uh, only becomes impregnated, she becomes Um Walad. Just by becoming impregnated, by missing a period, she's Um Walad. If the child is born, the child is the legal son or the legal daughter of that man by Sharia. There are no bastard children in Islam. Islam came to eliminate that. You see? And, and one of the things the Prophet ﷺ said, if a culture, if, if fornication becomes prevalent in a culture, then prepare yourselves for the wrath of Allah. You see? And the wrath is in those children. Because they're filled with rage. And look at what we've now reaching 50% in this country. Children born out of wedlock, we're reaching 50% or past. And look at all the crimes. Look at all the violence. There's rage. If you go into the prisons in this country and ask these men, they don't have fathers. They didn't have fathers. They don't even know who their fathers were. That's, that, is, that, is a, that is oppression. That's unjust. You can't do that to a human being. They have the right to know who their father is. And so Islam came to preserve that right through the prohibition of fornication and through the guidelines of sharia in proper marriage. And this is why Islam recognized any marriage outside of Islam. If two people become Muslim, they do not have to renew a marital contract. Islam recognizes marriages of other deens. You see, it doesn't, it's as long as it is a marriage that is recognized by the custom of a people. But two people living together with no responsibilities, Islam rejects that. Completely. And people forget that in 1968, it was major news in this country that a woman in, on the East Coast was kicked out of her university because she was living in sin. 1968, kicked out of a university because she was living in sin. People forget how quickly morals have changed in this culture. There was an article in News and World Report about uh, fornication. Uh, uh, premarital sex. And what they were saying was even conservatives won't condemn adult consensual premarital sex. They'll condemn teenage sex, but they will not condemn uh, adult, consenting adults, because everybody's doing it, the article said. Well, why should the children, why should the teenagers not do it, if that's their example? You see, why? And everything in this culture is saying have fun, enjoy yourself, the media is showing it, promoting fornication. Most of the uh, television sitcoms and the films, 
They don't have relationships. Marriages are usually dull and boring on television, uninteresting. It's, it's soap operas. What's exciting is illicit relations. Really? This is what they're seeing and this is what they're being conditioned to believe. Who did the have name child father's They keep their father's name. They, ca they can call uh, the stepfather, um, you know, what they want, nickname or whatever, but they, they have to understand that the stepfather is the stepfather. He's not a legal father. He's actually only a guardian. He's not a stepfather. We don't even have that term. We, and we do not have adoption. And the reason for adoption is see what happens. If, if I adopt a child and, and my last name is Hanson and that child takes my last name three, four generations down the road, they forget that there was an adoption. And suddenly they, that, they think that's their lineage. So lineage is maintained in Islam. Islam abrogated adoption, did not allow for adoption. The Prophet ﷺ adopted Zayd, called him Zayd ibn Muhammad. A fostering is the Prophet said, I and the one who takes care of a, a, an orphan are like this in Jannah. He put his two fingers together, it's one of the highest things you can do, right? Kafiru yatim is one of the highest things you could do to take care of people that don't have parental care. One of the highest things in Islam you can do. But you cannot say, this is my son, this is my daughter. That's a lie. That's a lie. They are not your son and daughter. And they're not your stepson, not your stepdaughter. You say, These are, this is my guard, this is my, uh, you know, ward. Right, exactly. It's my he said that the Prophet did... Uh, he adopted Zayd, absolutely. And he announced it at the Kaaba. So he did think. It's, no, that was abrogated. The Prophet ﷺ was prohibited to do that after. Yes, he did that b uh, before, the before. before. Yes, absolutely. So what do you do? He did that before Islam. Uh, are there any guidelines for adopting orphans? Uh, I mean, are there any books or things that we can refer to? Especially for this culture? Well, kafala is a, it's a, in fiqh, kafala is a, what's called kafala, which is taking care. It's taking care of the needs of, of children that don't have those to take care of them. Highly encouraged. And do they, do they explain like how to deal with a child when they're uh, infant? Like what if we adopt the child as infant? Uh, the child needs to know that the parents are not the original parents. Right, they need to be told that. And this is, you know, this is a big trauma in this country for many people who find out that they've been adopted. Big trauma. Is it true that you cannot give the child your last name? Only if it's your legal child. Like adopted? Yeah, you cannot give it your last name. It has its last name. Even the woman can't take, is not supposed to take your name. She's not uh, Mrs. So-and-so. She has her own lineage and that should be preserved. She's not, uh, she hasn't become you, right? That's a co-option. It's not part of the Muslim tradition. This is a modern, this is a bid'ah. You know, it's a modern, and it's bid'ah muharrama to do that, to, to give a woman a name that's not her lineage. No, she has her own. She's the so-and-so, the daughter of so-and-so. And we're pat patrilineal. The lineage goes through the father. Sometimes, rarely, men that were attributed to a woman because of her righteousness. I mean, that does happen. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, Taymiyyah is from his grandmother. Right? Taymiyyah was a woman. So that does happen, you know, sometimes. But we are not, patri we are not matrilineal, we're a patrilineal uh, dean. The dean is patrilineal. So I'm wondering what you're saying. First, it sounds like a couple of their parents could um, go through an adoption agency and raise a child as long as they get their, their child. But absolutely. No, they can do what this c culture calls adoption. You could do that legally, but you cannot say, this is my child. And if the child is older and they're not Muslim, at that time, can you, can you, you know, foster a non-Muslim child? Or would you have to teach the child? I mean, obviously you want to teach the child Islam, but how do you, how's that work? Like an adult, you mean, to take... Yeah, see, in Sharia, if, they're, if they've reached puberty, they're not children anymore. Well, I guess what I'm thinking about is, um, well, you know, in the States, you call it foster parent situation, like if you have a troubled youth, right. younger than puberty, but not infant, you know. No, you, I, there's nothing that says you can't help them if you want to. You can do that. 
Nothing in Sharia says you can't help them. But sometimes I know a sister who has adopted Muslim children and um, she has been told that she can't have them because she's Muslim. Yeah. And then she goes to the as children play, the other children tease them to tell them that they didn't, that that's not your mother, and she adopted them at a very early age. Is that the only mother that they know? They tease them? Yeah, other. That's, you know, Lord of the Flies syndrome. <laughs> right? And, then, I mean, well, the and children can be very cruel to other children. That's why you want to have your children around children that are well raised and learn not to do things like that. You know, not all children tease. You know, really. I mean, children should be socialized into uh, respect and should learn that they shouldn't do, and they can. It's not something they can't do, you know. And they will fall into things like that, but they should learn to, to respect, uh, you know, the feelings of others even at an early age. And that can be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. The first one was with the bond woman. Right. She, had, uh, she was a child by the man. Then she goes, she's no longer a bond woman. She becomes, she, she becomes what's called um walad. Right. She's no, she, cannot be, she cannot be sold. But the child is and the child is a legal child of that man and is in, inherits and everything. It's, a, it's the son of that man and takes the man's name. If a woman wanted to take her husband's last name, would that be permissible? If she wanted to take her husband's last name, yeah. you know, I don't know. I, I let me check on that. All right, I'd I'd prefer to because I, I don't I don't want to do. I mean, I have an idea. And I don't want to give a definitive because I'm not sure. So, let let me ask uh, Sheikh Abdullah what he says, or tomorrow Sheikh Abdullah, who's a mufti. The man coming tomorrow is a mufti. Her last name is not a Muslim last name, and then she marries a Muslim. No, it doesn't have to be. A, the, you know, the Sahaba had last names, they weren't Muslim. They, I mean, their fathers were mushrikeen, pagans. You know, Umar ibn al Khattab, al Khattab was not a Muslim. And it doesn't, name is a name. The name of your father is your father. Whether he's Muslim or not is, doesn't matter. That's your name. You know, like my name, my father's name was Hanson. That was his uh, father's name, and his father's name, and his father's name. Goes back to whoever the first Hans, you know, it means John, right? Son of John, Ibn Yahya. That's what it means. You know, it's, it's just, uh, that's the way the Europeans said, Ibn Yahya, Hans' son, son of Hans. Hans is Yohanna. And from the hinges, it's important in that way, then why do we convert you to the Oh, that's a first name, which is a choice. You don't have to take a Muslim name. If you become Muslim, you don't have to take... I shouldn't say a Muslim name. I would just say you don't have to take an Arabic name. Right? I mean, there were uh, many cultures where they didn't uh, all adopt Muslim names. You still go to Shiraz. We have a Shiraz here. We have a Shir. Shir is a Persian name. You know, we have uh, Mehnaz. Many names in... Uh, Right? There are many, many names. Persian names are very common. Even some Arabs name their, their uh, women Persian names. You'll find Persian names in the Arab communities. Right? You'll find Turkish names in, in, the, in the Arab world. That's just something, you know, in many cultures when you convert, even, even within the Christian tradition, uh, you, you often took a name. Like even within the Catholic tradition, uh, when you go into an order that, and you, 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 you read your vows, they often took a name of one of the righteous, the pious ancestors, so that they would become, their, their name might have been uh, Christopher or whatever, and then, and then they take their vow, they become Paul, or they become Peter, or they become, I mean even Paul's name was Saul. When he converted, he became Paul. So it, this is just a tradition within many cultures. The Prophet did not change people's names unless they were bad names because one of the rights of a child is to be given a good name by the father. So if he found somebody's name was inappropriate, he would change it. Like Shaqi means wretched. He t said, no, your name's Saeed, which means happy, felicitous. That's all. 
So if you want to take a name, you can take a name. If you don't want to, you don't have to. And there's an interesting book called Dawa in America, written by a Christian missionologist, which is people who study conversion. And he's actually not a Christian, he's a researcher. And he was doing this as an academic exercise. And one of the things he said in there is that he, that he studied the, the, the reasons people convert, and I think he identified about 10 dominant reasons, and he said that Islam was uniquely the only religion amongst the religions that Americans convert to that had all 10 of the reasons. And he said, so he had to deduce from that that the Muslims were just doing a really bad job at presenting their religion because they had so few conversions. But one of the things he said is he, he felt that, that Americans would not convert if, if they felt that they had to take uh, Arabic names. Right? And he, he actually felt that, that, uh, that Muslims should, if an American does become a Muslim, they should just keep their American name. That was his idea, anyway. I mean, he's not a Muslim, but it's an interesting concept, you know. So. so um, is it preferred but not required for Muslims to name their children? You don't have to name your child uh, an Arabic name. Nothing in Sharia says that you have to name your child uh, an Arabic There are good names to name because of who the people were. And the Prophet definitely said, Khairul Asma Ma'ubida wa Humida. The best names are those that have Abd in them or have praise like Mahmud, Hamid, Ahmed, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam those type names Hamid right those are the best names and Abdul Rahman there's another riwayah that's Abdul Rahman but you could if you were Greek you could name your child Demetrius there's no there's nothing in Sharia that says you can't do that right I actually thought about doing that one of my sons <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, but I thought my grandfather's name was Demetrius. You know, I thought about doing that. You know, Demi. <laughs> Demi. Demi. <laughs> Sounds too much like demon. <laughs> so, you know, that's. Nesib is important. First name, as long as you give them a good name. You know. There were. Juraj is a name that comes in the hadith. And Juraj is George. And the Prophet praised a, a, a monk whose name was Juraj. And you will find some Muslims that had that name, historically. George, Juraj. Right? Juraj is a Greek name, Yorgo. Right? So it's in the hadith, it's in a sahih hadith, Juraj. Prophet, he was one of the people that, um, you know, the infant spoke to, to, to uh, because uh, you know the story of Juraj, the monk? Um, they were, th these people were very envious of him and so they wanted to uh, to destroy his reputation and so they paid a prostitute to go to the, his, his monastery because he's a very righteous Christian and she came at the night and she said I don't have a place to stay will you let me in and so he, he was you know his humanity was there but at the same time he was worried because monks are flee the world and Women, you know, that was symbolic of the world for monks in a lot of ways. So, but his humanity, you know, the spirit of the law overrode the law. And he, so he led her into the monastery. And then she tried to seduce him. And he would put his hand into the, fi into the candle to remind himself of the fire. So he did not uh, sleep with her. But she went and then on the way back she failed. But she met a shepherd on the road back. And she seduced him and... She became impregnant and she claimed that Juraj seduced her. So the people went and tore down his, uh, his monastery. And then when the child uh, was born, uh, they went to the, the, the child and the child said she lied. In the child in, in the cradle said she lied. I'm the son of the shepherd. And so they, they knew that Juraj was, that he was... Uh, he was such a righteous man, that was a miracle that Allah gave to prove his innocence. And they, so they built him a monastery with gold. And <laughs> right? People are pretty horrific, right? <laughs> Whoops, sorry. <laughs> well, people do that, yeah. They change their names. I, 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 that's pretty sad. 
Let's put it that way. I don't think it's, I don't know if you could actually say that would be haram to, to do that. Unless he changed his last name, which is prohibited. In fact, the Prophet uh, said that anybody that called themselves by other than the name of their father, that he was free from them. He had no relation with them. So that's one of the things you cannot do. So somebody, you know, who was, whose last name was, um, you know, like uh, Zain al-Abidin and he changed it to Smith or something like that. Can't do that. But if his name was Muhammad and he came here and he changed it to Mo, you know, that, they do that, things like that, right? What if he was a non-Muslim and he changed his last name to Muslim? Well, I, when I converted, I... My, my father's name was, um, and my grandfather's name were Joseph. And, and I asked my sheikh if I could be Ben Yusuf. I asked him that. And he, and he said that, that I could do that. So, I don't know. Allah Ta'ala. But I went back to Hanson. You know, so, for a long time, that's, that's what I went by. I Arabized my name. And then I just thought, you know, I'm not an Arab. So, there's no reason why I should have an Arab name. As I kind of matured and got older, you know. <laughs> you're young, you're kind of zealous. And so then would you recommend for someone to change their last name if they convert? No. no? Just I wouldn't. Them? In fact, I really have reservations. I don't think it changes their name at all. I don't, legally. Because I have more problems in the Muslim world when they go to visit with a Muslim name than they would with a non-Muslim name. Unfortunately. So, because I've had that. I've suffered because of it. I've been... Um, denied entry into countries with an American passport simply because I had an Arab name in my passport. And I, I watched Americans go in next to me, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I just, you know, why bring yourself that trouble? There's no, there's no reason why you should do that, you know. There's nothing in Sharia that says you have to change your name. If you want to take a Muslim name, that's perfectly fine. You know, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's probably a good thing. It's just the first name though, right? Yeah, the first name. I wouldn't change the last name personally. Again, these are just... You know, but if you're denying your father, that's wrong to do that. 